Good morning, buenos dias, bon dia, guten morgen, hi Boan. Good morning, everybody, and every welcome everybody who is on Zoom or through our hybrid worship as well. It is a beautiful, rainy June morning, and welcome to Ainsworth United Church of Christ. No matter who you are, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And happy Pride Month, everyone! It is June. All right. 
Um, for the month of May through July, our church is in a time of reflection and renewal. While our pastor Lynn Smiles Lopez is on sabbatical, I and Noel, Reverend Noel Anderson is in here uh, serving as a sabbatical pastor, and it's an honor to be with you. And I welcome you all to join us on this journey as we walk and learn more together about the theme of the living spirit bridging the ages. So we have a few announcements I want to lift up. The first is um, we have all been watching the, the unfortunate news unfolding of gun violence in many different public venues, and as a precaution, Ainsworth UCC is, uh, has been in touch and has formed a security and safety team, has been in touch with the Portland Police Department with an officer, Leo Harris, who specializes in this area and will be providing a presentation on June 12th, immediately after worship, from 11.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. And we do think this is a really important thing for everybody to be able to to be a part of, and we are working to see if we can also get this on, on Zoom. So, um, with that, we have a, some exciting fellowship opportunities uh, the, for Juneteenth. We, our fellowship team is organizing a breakfast at 8.30 a.m. in Michael Hall, which will also include some of that education and history about Juneteenth. And we will also be in touch with you about, you know, a shorter service that day and going down together to the Pride March. And then um, I'll also, also offer Hector an announcement about Thursday Fellowship. Good morning. The Inch with United Church of Christ Fellowship and Ministry is for everyone. However, we have been getting mostly those of us who are over 85. So we would like to lower that age group down. We are invited to the Pat King Botanical Luncheon this Thursday at 11 a.m. at her home. Uh, I'm going to have an address, but if you have it, want, want to an address, it's in the directory. From 11 till 1, we will have this luncheon in her beautiful backyard garden. So please, be, uh, you're welcome, really. No matter how young you are, you are welcome to come and fellowship with some of us who are considered old geezers. Thank you. So please come out to the Thursday Fellowship, and we will have a coffee hour today immediately following worship that will be in the Cambridge Parlor. Um, and I'm also excited for the music today. We have the, the men's ensemble, the men's choir join us. See Dr. Wright, who hasn't been with us in the last couple of weeks, so glad to have him. And uh, my aunt, Beth Anderson, is visiting, and she'll be giving us a uh, gift of music as well with my wife, Nina Fernando. And do we have any other new folk in the congregation today? Okay, thanks. All right, welcome. All right, thank you for coming to visit us. Wonderful to have folk. Always good to be welcoming new folk and those who are visiting. And with that, we can let our worship begin. Are you excited about Pentecost today? Amen. Yes, so am I. So let our worship begin. We begin with the land and labor acknowledgement. We sit on the ancestral homelands of the Multnomah, Castellamit, Clackamas, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, bands of the Chinook, and many others who made their homes along the Columbia River. We honor the members of over 400 tribal communities who live in the Portland metro area. We acknowledge the labor of kidnapped and enslaved Africans and of Chinese workers and Latinx farm workers who have risked so much and received so little. They have all helped to build the wealth of this country. 
Please take a moment to honor the people who continue to resist and survive despite the intentional and ongoing attempts to destroy them. Would you please stand, if you can, and if you're able, and if you wish to, while we do the call to worship. Divine Teacher, whirl around us with your wisdom. As the holy winds fill our lives with dreams, empower us to live God's hope in this world. May the divine gales of this day move us to know the love of God. Amen. Our opening hymn this uh, morning is Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness, number 286. I'm going to take the liberty of saying why this is such a special hymn to me. Uh, the, the author, Jim, uh, what's his last name? Was uh, in school and seminary with me in, a long time ago. And he was writing hymns and songs even then. This particular hymn is one of the most beautiful he's ever written. Unfortunately, it, was, it came to be known as the longest hymn in the history of hymnology. But for our purposes today, we're only going to sing the chorus once at the beginning. But remember, Jim Manley, a wonderful, wonderful human being.
It's a beautiful song. Didn't you want to just sing that chorus like a few more times? <laughs> I know I did. Um, so we come together again today on really what is a joyous occasion of Pentecost. And we're excited about Ainsworth graduates as well. We'll be, we'll be talking a little bit about the graduates and graduation and those who have come up through the church who are on that rite of passage. We are talking about what does it mean to be a multiracial, multicultural, open and affirming congregation today. Yet we are also, once again, taking a moment to mourn those shootings in Tulsa and Ames, Iowa. In Tulsa, there was uh, Dr. Preston Phillips, I think worth mentioning, because he was one of just less than 2% who are African-American orthopedic surgeons who was shot and killed. So... As we once again honor victims and think together about all of us who are hurting in our congregations for many different reasons, or those of us who are celebrating as well, let us be in a spirit of prayer. Living spirit of love, be with our congregation, our city, our country as we go through these trying, tumultuous times with violence, and war, and injustice all around us. We find ourselves in a world that doesn't want to learn from each other's differences. A world full of greed, contempt, self-righteousness. From our lack of understanding comes apathy, complicity, and isolation that leads to conflict. And we lift up those, our prayers today for the families, the communities of those victims in Tulsa and Ames. And we honor them now with a moment of silence. We pray that these moments of pain might inspire us to action. We pray for a social change that can stifle this ongoing violence. We pray for a world where all belong, where there is no longer discrimination, but that we are all treated with equity and dignity. We pray for all those in this congregation and all of the family members and all of the community members who right now are hurting, who may be feeling pains in their bodies or maybe in their hearts. We pray specifically for Kathy Harmon and her retirement home as she's now stuck in her apartment as COVID cases are rising. We pray for Sharon Grant's family as they struggle with her mother facing dementia. We pray for prayers of thanksgiving for Diana Gray, who is now healing from a recent hip surgery. There are so many prayers that we bring today that are on our hearts. We lift those up to you now. Come, Holy Spirit. We pray that the Holy Spirit might fill this place, fill our hearts with the presence that we ask that holy healing grace today and every day that we might find deeper love and renewed joy. We pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Creator God, 
who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Nada te turbe, nada le espante, quien a Dios tiene, nada le falta, nada te turbe, nada te espante, solo Dios basta. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. Those who seek God shall never go wanting. Nothing can trouble, nothing can frighten. God alone deals us. Ain't nobody do it like Jesus. Ain't nobody. Ain't nobody, nobody do it like Jesus. Oh, ain't nobody do me like Jesus. Oh, ain't nobody do me like the Lord. Ain't nobody do me like. Oh. Pick me up and turn me around. And turn me around. Oh, you pick me up. And turn me around. Pick me up. And turn me around. Oh, he's my friend. Pick me up and turn me. And turn me around. Me, me and turn me around. You pick me up and turn me. Oh, Lord. You, my body told me to run away. Told me to run. You feel my body. Heal my body. Heal my body. 
No, 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 nobody can do. Nobody. No, no, nobody. Oh, nobody Do me like the Lord Oh, can't nobody do me like Jesus Can't nobody do me like Jesus Can't nobody do me like the Lord Can't nobody do me like the Lord Can't nobody do me like Jesus Can't nobody do me like Jesus Can't nobody do me like the Lord Can't nobody do me like Jesus Pick me up and turn me around. 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 He healed my body and told me to run on. Yes, he healed my body and told me to run on. Heal my body and told me to run on. Heal my body and told me to run on. So I wish I could sing. And it's difficult to follow such a beautiful selection. I'm going to invite those of you who are young, if you would like to, come forward. And I want to share some stories. But first, I just found something that I thought was extraordinary to find, find out. I was noticing who came to church this morning. And I'm not quite sure, but I'm wondering whether there was something happening in the atmosphere. Because I know this, and maybe you can see where I'm going with this. That Nylea is here. And Nola is here, and Nadia is here, and Naima is here. What was happening at this time in all of this? So I'm going to ask you, don't feel like coming for it, so I'm going to ask you to shout out and ask some questions and this is for anyone. What are you going to do this summer? What are you going to do this summer? Anyone? Are you going to look up, investigate? Okay. Anyone? What, what are you doing this summer? Huh? Swim. Okay, swimming. Yes. Sleep late. Yes. I like that. Go to camp. Excellent. Excellent. Garden. All right. All these things which are so exciting to do. Uh, 
I like especially sleeping late. Thank you for, for saying that. And as we think about what we're doing this summer, I want you to imagine what are you doing next year? Five years from now, ten years from now. Well, it might be hard to remember, and it might be hard to imagine. But next year, five years from now, and ten years from now, you will continue to grow and continue to transform to be the people that you are called to be. And so, every spring, at schools all over the world, people pause to reflect and remember and acknowledge the achievements people have done and completed and where they are going. So, I'm going to ask you not only to look forward, but to look back. Where were you one year ago? Five years ago? Ten years ago? And see that the transformation takes place. And so, this time of the year, we have what is sometimes called commencement, which means beginning anew. And so, we want to honor and praise those who have accomplished so much in their lives. We want to take a few minutes just to remember and to acknowledge those who are members of this church or family of members of this church who have achieved so much this year. Now, Naima probably can't imagine what it would be like in five or six years when she's getting ready. That would be more than that. And First grade? What grade is he? Kindergarten. Okay. So eight years from now, eight years from now, which she will be a much larger person. She probably can't imagine, or her parents can't imagine, what that will be like. But sometimes those who grow actually finish primary school at middle school. And one such person is Sidney Yor Appa Led, the son of Dr. Led. Sidney is graduating from the eighth grade at St. Anthony Catholic School in Tigard. And this fall, he will enter Tualatin High School. We congratulate Sydney and his parents. But after in eight years, you would, you know, you will probably continue in school, and you will continue maybe in high school and discover new things, new experiences, new things to do. And if you as you experience high school, you might decide, oh, I'm learning more and meeting more people. And then there will come a time in your 12th year, you will say, it is time for me to venture into new areas. And so we want to acknowledge those who have managed to negotiate the ins and outs of high school successfully. Among them are Francis Curry, and you can see a theme here, so, who graduated from Grant High School, 
and she will attend Scripps College in California. Her sibling, Catherine Curry, also graduated from Grant High School, and she will attend Wesleyan University in Connecticut. Here's another high school graduate who you'll hear in a few minutes. His name is Isaac Potter. And guess where Isaac graduated from? Grant High School. Isaac will attend Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. And he will focus on environmental studies. And his dad told me he will also focus on skiing. Recently, Maya Pukarana graduated from Barnard College of Columbia University in New York. I believe right now she is in Europe. Maya graduated with a degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Urban Study, with a concentration on environmental science. See these themes run through. In this fall, she, will, she has been accepted to the Paris School of International Relations, and she will be doing some language study in Morocco this summer. Also graduating from college is Norma Godfrey's granddaughter, Mercedes Brookins. She graduates with honors in English, from Whittier College in California. And Mercedes is planning to pursue her career and her passion in journalism in Southern California. And also graduating from college this year is Whitley Players. Whitney Whitley graduated summa cum laude from Lake Forest College in Illinois. She double major in English and politics and was elected into Phi Beta Kappa earlier this spring. Whitley is planning to work in digital marketing and social media. Wow. Let's just pause and Soak all of this in. And I, Ima, in eight years, we will celebrate you as well. But I would like to invite Isaac Potter to share a few words, and then we'll have a prayer afterwards. Mr. Potter, the stage is yours. Um, it's, been, it's been quite a long time I've been at this church. Um, you know, since I was born, oh, sorry. Since I was born, I've been coming to this church, um, you know, somewhat regularly, sometimes not so regularly, uh, for the last 18 years. And um, it's a big part of my experience throughout my schooling and throughout high school and throughout just my childhood. And um, I'd just like to thank all of you. Um, and just thank this church because it's really been an amazing uh, community to have access to and a really great support system that I'm really grateful for. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be taking a lot of the lessons I learned here with me through and into college and throughout the rest of my life. So... Thank you.
Thank you, Isaac, Mr. Potter. And I will not embarrass the congregation with pictures of you when you were this tall. <laughs> As only a proud grandfather could say, I invite you to join me in a word of prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to here today. We remember and give thanks for those who are able to study and learn and share the opportunity to gather, to discover new things, to gain new insights into the world and ourselves are only things that we can do together. We thank you, O oh God, for all those who are able to study and celebrate their achievements. We pray, O oh God, for those who we acknowledge this day. Continue to watch over Sydney as he ventures into secondary school and encounters new insights, new adventures. Watch over and keep him safe and let him become the person he can be. We give you thanks, O oh God, for those who have managed the sometimes rough passages of high school. We thank you, O oh God, for Catherine and ask that you continue to be with her as she goes to college on the East Coast, strengthen and give her wisdom. For Frances, we ask your continued care and love surround her. Be with her as she goes to California to study. We thank you, O oh God, for Isaac and for the opportunity he has. We thank you for the blessing he has been to us and ask that you continue to watch and keep him as he goes to study in the state of Washington. And we give you thanks, O oh God, for those who have completed their college education and ventures out into the world to share the gifts with all those around. We thank you for Maya and for the gifts she share and ask that you be with her as she continue her studies this summer and next year. We thank you for Mercedes and what a blessing she has been to her family and to us. We thank you that you have led her into the field of journalism. Continue to guide her and give her the strength She needs. And we thank you for Whitley. For the amazing things she has done, not only at home, but in her university. We thank you for how she has studied and how she is now using the gifts that she has honed while in the university for all those around her. Bless and keep these 
those we have named. Bless and keep those who are studying and will continue their studies. Bless and keep all of us as we seek to transform this world to more accurately reflect our hopes, our loves, and our desire for a world where all are welcome, loved, encouraged. Hear our prayers, O God. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Thank you, you, graduates, and thank you all who have continued to nurture and guide your family and your students. I'll invite those who would like to continue uh, to Sunday school. So the middle high school will join JJ, and the others will join this Pat and I upstairs. Thank you. From the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. <clears throat> when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from the heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. People of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heaven above, and signs in the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. 
The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's a powerful scripture, isn't it? Don't you love Pentecost? We have our our beautiful red decorations and flowers, and thank you, Shannon, for for putting this together. We had our amazing music. Hey, nobody do me like Jesus. And we have more amazing music to come. Thank you to all of those who pitched in to help clean. Uh, Elvira, thank you for helping organizing that work day. I understand you really know how to exercise all the dust balls, which we can tell from the cleanliness that we are experiencing. So thank you. <clears throat> so as you know, uh, our sabbatical theme is living spirit bridging the ages. So today we are talking about how the Holy Spirit, the living spirit, comes to us in ways that can move across cultures, languages, classes, orientations, and generations. Ainsworth, well, the wind is moving, I feel the spirit here blowing my sermon around. Um, at Ainsworth UCC, we are a congregation where we can claim multiracial, multicultural, open and affirming, welcoming, inclusive, engaging, and supportive around mental health issues, and a sanctuary congregation. We've got a lot going on, right? Yeah. And in many ways, we have been living out what does it mean to be a Pentecost church. And I understand this is one of Pastor Lynn's favorite Sundays. I think she's celebrating with us in a land far away. Yet, no matter where we are on our journey as a congregation, there is still so much that God has to teach us. And I hope we can think more about what Pentecost means to us in this current moment that we're living through. How does our call change in today's context? How is doing ministry different on June 5th, 2022, than it was in January of 2019, just before the pandemic? Or going back to the formation of Ainsworth UCC in 1985, a few things might have changed in the last 37 years. When the minimum wage was $3 an hour, gas was about a dollar, and we had rotary dial phones, and there wasn't any soccer practice on Sunday mornings. A different time. The world keeps changing. Not long ago, the metaphor for the United States uh, was one of the melting pots that people should assimilate into a predominantly white majority culture. Many still believe this, but from the civil rights movement on, sociologists started using the salad bowl metaphor that we should really value and honor the uniqueness of each culture and language. It seems that the Pentecost story might support this theory. We learn from our history, our tradition, and our scripture. We try to understand the social historical frame of which it was written. Then we try to piece together how does it make sense in our current day ministry. Pentecost actually took place during the festival of Shavuot, a large gathering of Israelites from across the regions coming together to mark the harvest of the wheat. But it was also the time in which they honored the giving of the Torah from Moses. Although this was predominantly a Jewish celebration, people from all over were included. We hear people from Greece, from, we had Arabs, we had Romans, we have all kinds of languages, ones I hadn't heard of before. 
But the Holy Spirit touches the disciples, enabled them to communicate across the languages. The audience hears God's message in their native tongue, speaking across nations and cultures and time. To me, this message of a, is one of inclusivity, meant to move throughout the different genders, orientations, races, classes, and generations. Now, each generation is different. Some might even say they have their own culture. I don't have to tell the parents in this room that each child is different. And we need to communicate them in way, to them in ways that they understand. The other day, I pulled my son out of the car while it was raining, and I asked him to put on his rain jacket. He started refusing, so I said, it's raining. You need to put on your rain jacket or you're going to get wet. And he said, no, 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 <laughs> refusing. So then I said something that a father probably shouldn't say. I said, you're being ridiculous. And he quipped a quick response in return for someone less than two years old and said, you're being ridiculous. <laughs> I think he was right. Um, <laughs> a couple minutes later, my Aunt Beth, who's visiting, took a different approach. She, here we go, <laughs> she said, do you see the dinosaurs on your jacket? Do you want to be fierce like they are? Then put your jacket on so you can be fierce like the dinosaurs. And of course, this met a better response from my son Ion because it was speaking to his level. Our choice of languages makes a difference in how meaning is conveyed, how we communicate to people at certain moments and contexts matters. As we continue to pray for the victims of gun violence and their families, there has been much discussion about how we pronounce the town's name Uvalde which indicates the power of language in mixed communities. I was reading from an NPR article. There isn't exactly a correct pronunciation. The language of the people who live there exists on a sliding spectrum between Spanish and English, and often consists of a combination of the two, Uvalde being the English pronunciation and Uvalde being the Spanish pronunciation, or something in between. We have to remember that English was forced upon Mexican ancestry, people living in Texas, probably beginning with the Texas War of Independence and thereafter. Spanish was actually forbidden in schools, and children were punished for speaking it. Spanish itself is an imposed colonial language forced upon native indigenous people of Mexico and Central America. A professor from UC Santa Cruz, Kristen Silva Gruis, says, Language is alive. It is not fixed. Academies of language and purists will try to fix it and correct it, but people are living. Language changes over time, and it's part of that change that keeps things vibrant and interesting presupposing that Spanish is a Latino identity, can erase the indigenous history of many Latin Americans. But there also exists a tension between newly arriving immigrants who may only speak Spanish and those who have lived here for generations who may only speak English. Professor Gruis suggests that maybe the most honest and authentic way to represent a community's past and present is to make room for those complexities and understand that it can be messy. The living spirit is vibrant and moving, and we have to allow sometimes for the messiness when it comes to the movement and the change we are called to. Now, maybe some of you, you know, speaking of messy, you might have heard of some of the internal office conflicts between generations. Usually it's between the baby boomers and the millennials. A couple of jokes that illustrate this. Uh, how do baby boomers change a light bulb? They don't. They just keep talking about how great the old ones used to be.
<laughs> they were good, right? Um, how many millennials does it take to change a light bulb? None. They accept it for who it is and then head back to their safe space. <laughs> Sometimes these generational differences might be overplayed or even manufactured, but the reality between how different generations and people at different stages of life perceive the world is real. As a congregation that seeks to engage more young people, we have to challenge ourselves to do new things and bring in the voice and the leadership according to young people's passion. Just as we find the ways to adjust to the changing neighborhoods around us, that makes us more diverse. Wasn't it wonderful to hear Isaac speak today? Thank you for lending your voice. It is powerful to hear how church impacts people over time. But I think we want to ask ourselves, how is it that we as churches sometimes need to change in ways that can actually make it so young people or diverse folk want to be here, feel welcomed? In Reverend Jackie Lewis's book, Ten Essential Strategies, strategies for becoming a multiracial congregation, she talks about a case study of a congregation going through change, trying to adapt to the changing neighborhood, the changing demographics from where they were located, and the values of incoming neighbors that they felt were at odds. They said, well, they're not like us, even though they held many of the same common values, basic needs, health care, good education, adequate housing, meaningful work something we all have in common, but instead they were being seen as other, which became an excuse to not engage or to welcome newcomers. Part of this resistance to change comes from a nostalgia, a harking back to a former time when many long-term church members forged their memories and trying to recreate programs that worked in a different time. This can, of course, become a barrier to adapting to the type of change that we need now to try to truly be diverse, multiracial, multigenerational. Change in our congregation, just like in our society and culture, is always met with some resistance. We look at the history of Pride Month. Where did it come from? It started with the Stonewell riots, but that wasn't the first time the LGBT people stood up against the police harassment, such as in Los Angeles and in San Francisco's Compton's Cafeteria. Following those Stonewell riots, organizers wanted to build on that spirit of resistance. The following year, they organized a march to Central Park and adopted the theme of gay pride as a counterpoint to the prevailing attitude of shame. The idea that LGBTQ plus would would march in the streets, proudly declaring their existence in a prideful way, was truly revolutionary at the time. It took a sense of audacity and courage and, and was a giant step forward. And as they marched down Christopher Street in West Village, this tradition expanded from city to city to what we know over 50 years later today. Out of resistance, opportunities for change can grow. We see this in our text today, the naysayers trying to counter the disciples. This text becomes one in which the early Christian movement is founded and one of the reasons the gospel spreads But it's important to recognize that at the time, the apostles didn't necessarily see themselves as starting a new religion. They were really a growing sect within Judaism. The interconnected, intertextual, and overlapping values they had maintained with Judaism. And Shavuot was a celebration of the Torah being given in the desert as Israelites escaped slavery in Egypt and searched for the promised land. And part of this tradition, Jewish tradition that rabbis had, was one of 
the Talmud, the oral histories being passed down, the Midrash, the study, the commentary, and the interpretation. Because religion is not a monolith. It is ever-changing, ever-shifting with multiple interpretations. Like we say in the UCC, God is still speaking. God is still speaking. And we see this, this way in which we can be fluid between tradition and what does it mean to take our traditions and our scriptures and to adapt them to our current context. As Peter quotes the prophet Joel, who understood that in that time that Joel was writing, there was famine, there was drought, there was a call that he had towards redemption, towards the vision of a new era where all Jews that had been scattered among nations and had been sold into servitude could return in freedom. That God would be the hope of the people and the mountains shall drop down new wine and the hills shall flow with milk and the rivers of Judah shall flow. This is what we hear in Joel 3.18. Peter's reference to a time of famine during a harvest festival, is indicative of the call to a shift of theology where we hear about God's wrath and punishment to an understanding of a renewed covenant at the time of the Pentecost, a forgiving God who freely grants grace, whereas Joel calls in several verses for Judah's rivals, Egypt and Edom to become desolate wilderness to pay for the violence against the children of Judah. The living spirit enabled the disciples to speak to people across nations and find that common message. We have that capacity through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak to one another across languages, across cultures, across genders, across orientations, across class status, across generations, and across religion, religious traditions. The Pentecost moment is speaking to the church to empower us to be inclusive and welcoming to all people no matter where they are on life's journey. Not just tolerance in a passive way, but truly welcoming and actively accepting. Not just welcoming in a Portland Knights kind of way, but also actively working to bring equity and justice, not just in our churches, but in our communities, in our societies, so that those who are traditionally put on the margins, those who are seen as foreigners, those who are seen as outcasts, can come together. People of all nations, indigenous, people of color, LGBTQIA, baby boomers, millennials, generation Y, generation X, Y, and Z, and everyone else can find a place to belong. Yes. Acts 2, 43-47, just after this story, says, All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, they spent much time in the temple. They broke bread at home and they ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the good will of all people. So that we can learn from the Pentecost moment. We can come together around a vision that all people, all God's children can find forgiveness, redemption, and equity for all through the living spirit. When through famine and pain, when home is the belly of the beast, we can find a safe place to land. And at Ainsworth, we are doing this. But let us continue to do this. Let us learn to honor the uniqueness of each person and respect the dignity both at an interpersonal level but also in that struggle to stop institutionalized discrimination. Let us meet the challenge of today's pandemic context to still push on with intergenerational ministries and reach out to young people in a way and a language that works. We cannot allow the beauty of nostalgia to hinder us in this quest to move forward 
as we learn to listen to the ever-changing living spirit, to the new voices, the new diversity in our ministry, let us be the living spirit that bridges the ages and crosses cultures. Amen. to our wonderful Reverend Hector. Pastor, I wanted a moment of reflection after the, that incredible sermon. So uh, that's why I was sitting waiting. <laughs> but thank you. I, I, I kind of want to hear what that reflection is. You want to give another sermon? <laughs> The offering is one of the most sacred and joyful moments in the life of a congregation or in the life of any community of faith. I had the privilege of traveling to an Africa, African Ecuadorian village up in the, uh, what do you call those mountains over there? The, um, the Andes, right? The Andes, was about 13,000 feet high. There was this African Ecuadorian village that had been there for over 300 years. And we had the privilege of worshiping with them. And to my surprise, when it came time to the offering, they turned it into a sacred, glorious party. It took them 20 minutes to take up the offering. And there were only about 30 people in the church. I ask, what is going on? And they say, we are celebrating the joy of thanksgiving for all of God's gift to us. So we come to return whatever we have. And they, they brought fruit, vegetables, money, animals even, to the offering. And that's what I wish for us. That this moment not be, oh my God, you know, they want another dollar but for it to be a really sacred event, a joyful event, in which we share with each other, with this incredible congregation that can do miracles because of your generosity. So, are you ready for sacredness and joy? Oh boy, they're not quite ready yet. Are you ready for a wonderful, joyous party of giving? All right. Please come get our money. Safer than breathing When letting go Is braver than keeping When innocent words Turn to lies And you can't hide By closing your eyes 
When pain is all that they offer Like the kiss from the lips of a monster You know the salmon so well But never met the feet When home is the belly of the bee The ocean is one over your head And the boat beneath you is sinking Don't need room for your bags Hope is all that you have Say the Lord's prayer twice The baby's twice Surely someone will reach out a hand And show you a safe place to land Oh, imagine yourself in a building Up in flames being told to stand still The window's wide open This leap is on faith You don't know who will catch you Maybe somebody will The ocean is wilding over your head And the boat beneath you Sinking. Don't need room for your bags Hope is all that you have So say the Lord's Prayer twice Hold your babies tight Surely someone will reach out ahead And show you a safe place to land Be the hand of a hopeful stranger Little scared but you're strong enough Be the light in the dark of this danger Till the sun comes up Be the hand of a hopeful stranger You're strong enough Be the light in the dark of this danger Till the sun comes up Be the hand Little scared Start here, but if you would like to stand, uh, if you're capable of standing and want to, please stand for the hallelujah. Um, where are we here? Hallelujah, 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 
together in the prayer of dedication. Because the living spirit has touched us and changed us, we seek ways to share our love through our treasures, talents, and time. Whether we give in this hour or throughout this week, may we remember that God's spirit encircles these gifts with hope. Let us talents and tongues employ. Again, earth can breathe again. That's the word around loaves of ground. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again. That's the word around loaves of bound. Christ is able to make us one. At his table, the set the tone. Teaching people to live to bless. Love and word and deed expressed. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, that's the word around love abound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, that's the word around love abound. Jesus calls us in, sends us out, bearing fruit in the world of doubt. Jesus loves to bring every share, God Emmanuel everywhere. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, at the word again, loaves abound. Jesus lives again, earth can breathe again, at the word again, loaves abound. Beautiful. Come to this table where the bread and cup are transformed by the Spirit of God into a meal of love and grace, a supper of vision and dreams, a, to a table where all souls are welcome. Loving God, you brought the Spirit into the world. Your breath continues to transform our world from the still to the stirring. Before the earth was formed, the Spirit of God swirled through the voids and the shadows. The divine air continues to fill us up through feast and famine when we are full and empty. On this day of Pentecost, when we celebrate the breath of Spirit coming upon the disciples, we invite the Spirit to come upon these elements. God of wind, pour out your loving, your living Spirit to make the elements come alive for us. Make this meal awaken our senses and give us strength to work for justice, to build a world where all are welcome and truly Included, may this time of eating and drinking unite us as one, where we stir from sadness and rise from our hopelessness. May we begin to celebrate visions and animate the dreams that have only been alive in our minds. 
Amen. So on that night in which Jesus gave himself up for love and justice, he sat down at the table with those who had become family. And at that table were those who adored him and those who would betray him. He knew this, and he gave the bread to all anyway. And he took the bread, and he broke it. He said, take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then Jesus took the cup, invited all to drink from this cup of love, a sign of the covenant of relationship. Whenever you gather as families around the tables, whenever you strive to overcome the adversity of being human together, whenever you need to remember I am always with you. Do this. I invite you to raise your hand in the ancient posture of blessing as we pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice, let them be for us the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be for the world the body of Christ, liberated by his witness, passion, and life. Be with us, Holy Spirit. Fill us so that we can move through us. Amen. Eat this bread Drink this cup, come to me, and never be hungry. Eat this bread, drink this cup, trust in me, and you will never thirst. We invite you up by rolls to come and take the bread and the cup, commune, and then return to your seats. So we'll come forward from the rolls in the back forward. Salvation. 
the multitudes, provided the manner in the wilderness, and blessed the elements. We give great thanks for the meal eaten and the company surrounding us. Inspire us as we move forward this day, and encourage us to transform our dreams into reality. Amen. Amen. And join, join me now as, as you're able in the benediction. In each gust of wind, may we reach out to God of inspiration. In each flicker of flame, may we follow the Christ of light. For the Spirit of God surrounds us, filling our hearts with dreams, our minds with visions, and our souls with energy to create the realm of God on earth. Amen. Join us for the closing hymn, number 575, O for a World. O for a world where everyone respects each other's ways, where love is lived and all is done with justice and with praise. O for a world where goods are shared and misery relieved, where truth is spoken. Children fair and eulogy achieve. We welcome one great family and others with each choice. 
plan opens us to unity and gives our vision voice. The poor rich man becomes strong, the poor the wise. Still a moon, how cast he long, who perish he will rise. Oh, for a whole day, the glorious reign of peace. Where will all be loved, we'll see.